heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll get the read on the state of the e-commerce consumer as we break down the earnings from Walmart with strong online growth. Plus, the largest maker of computer networking equipment making headway in AI and security technology. We break down Cisco's results. Meanwhile, Adyen are raising $20 billion of market value in one day alone after posting the slowest revenue growth since that European payments giant's IPO. We'll bring you the details. Meanwhile, talking of an erosion, we're looking at, once again, sentiment on the downside when you're looking at the Nasdaq off by three tenths percent. These aren't enormous moves, but the volumes are low and we're continuing to see nervousness around what is happening in the bond market, the significant sell-off, the rate at which we are inclining in yields. We're seeing another six basis points added on the 10-year. This is coming thick and fast and it is destabilizing. We're seeing, of course, UK yields up. You're seeing really across the world a movement to out of bonds and a view that we'll see interest rates continuing to have to remain at a sustained high level. Interesting, we got some reprieve in China. Look, China is throwing everything it can, it seems, from a government perspective, at stabilizing the economy as we worry about the property sector, as we worry about the overall economic slowdown. We're up 1.1% or there and thereabouts after significant sell-off on what have been some of these big Chinese names traded here in the US. Tell you what's also falling off a cliff. Let's have a quick look at Bitcoin. Look, I mean, it's a volatile asset class. We are suddenly taking a bit of a dive at midday. We're off by 3.5% at the moment. A lot of this to do with the fact that bond yields are moving higher, the fact that we're getting out of risk assets in general, and it seems to be taking an impact, in particular, on the world of Bitcoin at the moment, Ed. But, I mean, talk about falling off a cliff, for one. Right. Yeah, straight to Europe and Adyen. This is a name in European tech that we do talk about. The fintech player notching its slowest top line growth since it went public. The story, higher interest rates weighing on its ability to earn, but also pricing competition, particularly here in North America. We're going to go to our team in Europe. We're going to get the company perspective from Amsterdam and then understand the market reaction from London later in the show. It's a name that we need to dig into because I don't think either of us saw this earnings season, this European name coming. Severe reaction, biggest drop on record. Here in the US, two names that we're watching in the earnings context. The first, Cisco. The AI story, Cisco benefiting, booking $500 million of sales already on its AI products. Growth slowing, but the street seems to like the forecast. We're going to get details from our editors in the next block. Walmart, now down 1.6%. Second consecutive quarter where the outlook's been raised. But here's the one for me. E-commerce sales in the quarter jumped 24%. This is an e-commerce story of Walmart. So let's get more details. Bring in Bloomberg's Brendan Case, who covers Walmart for us out of Dallas. Brendan, just run us through the top line of these earnings. Yeah, so the, the big picture for Walmart is that they easily surpassed Wall Street de- Wall Street's estimates for the second quarter. Little bit light on the third quarter forecast, so I think that's probably why shares are down. Another reason is that there's just been so much enthusiasm about Walmart this year that anything less than perfect is going to hurt the shares. Um, dropping down to, to e-commerce, though, that was a real bright spot, up 24%. Uh, and that's the second straight quarter of, of, of really strong growth in, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so definitely a big, a big point of, uh, of pride for Walmart there. Yeah, Brendan, just talk to us about what they're doing right here. Is it that they're gaining market share? Is it they're able to claw more e-commerce bucks off their own customer already? Or they're peeling it away from Amazon? So there's a couple, a couple different things to sort of unpack there. And one of them is... Uh, something that doesn't have anything to do with with placing orders for groceries. It's advertising, which is included in their e-commerce business. Walmart has a, a big multi-billion dollar advertising business that in all respects except for one is, uh, you know, big and successful. The one way in which it isn't is that it still dramatically trails Amazon. So, you know, boosting that business is a big priority for Walmart. They're doing it, but they still have a long way to go. Uh, and then if you sort of switch to the shopper side, uh, what you're seeing, a couple interesting trends there. You're seeing strong growth in drive up, you know, people going to the store to pick up online orders. But you're also seeing growth, which actually surpassed drive up this quarter in delivery. So you're getting more and more customers who are tapping into the delivery uh, options that Walmart offers. 
Brendan, you and I wrote a story almost a year ago now together about how Walmart does have nearly as many shelf pickers for online orders as it does, you know, people working in physical stores. Did, you, did we get any sense from the call about structurally how Walmart's adjusting its business for this kind of surge in e-commerce demand that you outlined, 24 percent jump in the quarter? Yeah, they, they, gave, they gave a bit of an update on their supply chain efforts. And so what they're trying to do is they've got a lot more automation going to their big distribution centers. The other thing they're doing is they're starting to build out uh, what they call fulfillment centers, which are uh, inside stores but not visible to customers. And what they're designed to do is get a lot of the, the product pickers out of the aisles and have a dedicated part of the store that is designed to, to, to send stuff out to, to customers. What you're going to see in the coming years as that, as that ramps up is just a bigger and bigger capability to, to do that delivery. Uh, it looks based on the second quarter results like there is a lot of demand for that, but time will tell. Brendan, great analysis. We thank you so much, Brendan Case, of course, of Bloomberg. Meanwhile, we want to dig into some of the advertising flair that Brendan was just outlining there and ultimately how Walmart is bigging up its e-commerce prowess. Alistair McLean Foreman's with us, CEO of Ticketmetrics. It's a leading optimization platform for marketplace brands. $10 billion plus in total annual ad sales optimized. And I know you know Walmart intimately, Alistair. What in the playbook is really working for them? How are they managing to lure over new brands, for example? Well, they're brilliant results. You know, Walmart's certainly gaining share. And at Takeometrics, we're using AI to optimize for the largest share of brands selling on walmart.com. And we've got billions of dollars of data. So we knew these results would be good. The marketplace seller volume is accelerating. They're building a flywheel of selection of thousands of brands. And they're turning into a technology powerhouse. They're investing in the APIs, building a lot of tech to enable AI companies just like ours to go even faster. And I think that's a big part of it, the technology. You know, we, we kick off the show, right, Caro? Bloomberg Technology, and we start talking about Walmart. And some of the audience out there going, Walmart, what are you talking about? But e-commerce, advertising, and Alistair's just brought in AI. Alistair, what's your read on how competent Walmart is in those fields relative to Amazon? Because in the context of ads or AI, we've been talking about Amazon for a while, Walmart, it's a newer conversation. Well, they're, they're, they're doing very, very well. They're investing a ton. Seth Dallaire is the CRO over at Walmart. And the Walmart Connect segment, that's the Walmart ads business, is, is really growing uh, leaps and bounds in terms of the technology and the investment. And, you know, they're really moving very quickly, very, very quickly. It's interesting as well, Caro, consumers in this equation why e-commerce jump in the quarter? 24% yeah. is a big move. Yeah, and I mean, tell us the read on data there, Alistair, as to whether, well, some of your underlying thoughts on whether the consumer is resilient at this moment, whether it's just Walmart has got all the right price points for any type of consumer in this moment, because all of us are trying to read these tea leaves. Yes, the numbers look great, but both Target and Walmart sounded pretty conservative and indeed a little cautious about the consumer right now. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things of the data we see is the change in the Walmart consumer. I think there's this stigma that maybe Walmart is uh, all about older shoppers or, um, or traditional shoppers, but the, the growth in the modern uh, younger consumer that's uh, opening up their wallets, uh, they've got one of the fastest growing apps um, on the mobile side of things. Uh, and there's a really, really big play around omni-channel. Mm. The, the fact that Walmart.com can really do things that other marketplaces cannot is really, really powerful. And they can connect the dots between online and offline. And that's what every brand wants, that omni-channel play. Just remind us how international Walmart is as well, because for me, it's a purely American name. But no, it's mm. in India, it's in Mexico, we're seeing strength. I mean, we all, in, as UK three voices here, we all knew it for having had Asda at one point. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, of course, the Flipkart asset they have in India. I think what is very, very interesting from an international perspective is their focus on recruiting and acquiring those marketplace sellers from overseas to sell into Walmart.com. That was one of the biggest drivers of Amazon's success in its marketplace, the flywheel of sellers. So we're seeing Walmart doing a lot globally, attracting brands from overseas very, very similar to the Amazon playbook, and it is certainly working. 
Alistair, if you're an advertiser, why is Walmart an attractive option relative to any other e-commerce name? Well, I can tell you the data that we have is the return on ad spend or ROAS, which is the primary metric that advertisers use to determine their ROI. Those results on Walmart and the Walmart Connect platform are fantastic. It is very, very profitable to sell and advertise on walmart.com. And really that's what's attracting more and more of sellers coming over. It's less competitive, it's more of a green field. And uh, as I said, the ROI, the ROAS, return on ad spend is really best in class. And we expect that to continue. All right, Alistair McLean, foreman of Taken Metrics. New name to the show. Thank you for joining us here on Bloomberg Technology. Now, speaking of Walmart, China's internet regulator are reaching out to foreign firms, including the retail giant. They plan to discuss ways to navigate Beijing's new data security rules in an effort to reassure multinationals worried about their ability to operate in China under these latest regulations. Now, coming up here on the show, the largest maker of computer networking equipment making headway in AI, but also security technology. We're going to break down Cisco's results next. Those shares up 4%. Quick look at Palantir shares also down pretty sharply, 7%. Not any headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal, but I would say that it's been on a pretty sharp trajectory downwards in recent weeks from being heavily overbought. And I think it's just come through its 50-day moving average for all of you technical chart fans out there. This is Bloomberg Technology. still thick and fast. Let's dig into Cisco now. Shares moving higher after delivering results that actually pointed to some resiliency there in demand. CEO Chuck Robbins really focusing on the company's AI potential. Who'd have thought it? Saying, quote, this is a huge opportunity for Cisco. We are laser focused on leading and winning in this space. Let's get more on the results. Nick Turner's with us. And Nick, I mean, how do they profit? How do they capitalize on this AI moment? Well, it's still pretty early days. I mean, they did point to $500 million in sales from AI products. I mean, we're talking about stuff that sort of helps things speed through the process of uh, training large language models and generative AI. So just we've been focused a lot on the kind of chips that people need to run that from NVIDIA and others. But obviously, network's part of that. networking is part of that equation as well. And they expect to sort of be a big player in the space. Mm. Let's geek out for a moment because, Ed, you're a man who gets excited about networking gear, aren't you? Yeah, like, you know, Cisco's like the old school name in Silicon Valley, right, down in San Jose. But the logic's really clear. As all of the hyperscalers, cloud providers want to offer more compute, they need more networking gear for the data centers. And so Cisco, like, sweeps in. Like, we got it, guys. We're the biggest networking gear player. No worries. And um, what was interesting, though, Nick, is that you look at the forecast for the rest of the year, it didn't really have much to do with AI. They're kind of coming out of a period where they were playing catch up anyway from the pandemic. No, yeah, I mean, the if you look at their sales forecast itself, it looks pretty bad. It's a really terrible comparison with the, the last year, the year they just ended, because they had this huge backlog that built up when there was no supplies available. So sales surged uh, 11%, and now this year they're only going to grow at 2% or so. So it's obviously a big come down, but the executives have been like, look, we knew kind of this was going to happen, and, and uh, if you look at sort of growth, in a more longer term perspective, uh, it's not a huge issue. We're just entering the first quarter of fiscal 2024. So we just finished fiscal 2023 to your point. Chuck Robbins talks a lot about recurring revenue. Um, just explain a recurring revenue and, and what Cisco is doing to make money elsewhere. Well, so it, traditionally, as you said, this was the massive networking gear company that could kind of do no wrong in the old days of Silicon Valley. I mean, they would sell these systems. Everybody needed them. Uh, you know, big hardware, expensive hardware, and maybe they would sell you some software with that. The problem is, is it, it does tend to be um, lumpy, as they say, in terms of the sales. Like you'll have a lot of sales one quarter and then less the next. They're trying to get people more on a subscription model. So you're paying a certain amount each quarter and it's just it's more reliable. Where are analysts on the view of Cisco? Where is sentiment more broadly on this particular name? What's the run up been like? 
Well, I think people have been pretty excited about sort of the last year or so and just, uh, you know, optimistic that this is a, you know, if, if you look at year over year or, you know, the past five years or so, it's been a little bit inconsistent in general in terms of growth. I think they, obviously Cisco had this moment in the past year where they really were able to, uh, you know, turn the engines on full throttle. And um, I think people are more optimistic than might be expected about the coming year, even though sales are decelerating. The, the final component we wrote about was security as a, as a sort of standalone mark of Cisco. Really quick, Nick, what did they say about security? Um, it, it was one of those, you know, there's three things they sort of called out, uh, AI, data center, security, and obviously those are all three huge buzzy things that people want to see you growing in. And um, they said they've kind of make, made progress in all of them. I, you know, I mean, I don't know if they were quite as specific on security in terms of how much progress lately, um, but uh, but it's definitely going to be a key thing for them. Nick, great to catch up with you. Thank you. One of the shining lights today in terms of earnings. All things Cisco. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we've got all things global smartphone market. The, it's heading for its worst year in a decade. We'll discuss why next. And speaking of smartphones, look, Apple, a big tug on the broader NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 today. It's really pulling down from a points perspective. Disappointing earnings report goes back a week or so. But really, the pressure is on for this company now to deliver its latest version of the iPhone. There's plenty of juicy content on the Bloomberg about this, about how, well, in about six weeks' time, we've got to be eyeing up what the tech giant is going to be doing, having reported its third straight quarter of declining sales. We've got some analyst expectations out there. Shares expected to rise ahead of the event, citing historical data. But look, tell you what's also not rising. Ed, check out what's happening in the world of crypto. I just want to shine a light in that really just before the show, we took another leg lower on the world of Bitcoin. And this is more about market sentiment. This is more about bond markets selling off, yields driving higher, the dollar in focus. Yeah, rate concerns, a top story. This is Bloomberg. Let's get your daily dose of talking tech. First up, global smartphone shipments are headed for their worst year in over a decade. Shipments expected to drop 6% year over year, according to the latest CounterPoint research estimate. That's due to a disappointing demand, particularly in the US, but a deteriorating Chinese economy. Plus, as smartphone sales dwindle, the top three US wireless carriers, uh, carriers have lost billions in revenue. AT&T, T-Mobile and Verizon have collectively lost nearly $5 billion in equipment sales over the past 12 months compared to the previous year. And it's not just smartphones. The world's biggest PC maker, Lenovo, missed profit estimates for the second quarter, underscoring the depth of the global electronics market downturn. Caroline. I mean, let's just talk about missing expectations for a moment, Ed. We're going to pivot away to Europe because Adyen wiping out more than 13 billion. In fact, I think it was 20 in the end market value falling over, as you'll see, 30, almost 40 percent in a trading day after missing first half revenue estimates. For more on the Dutch payment processing company and well, the competition that's pretty rife over here in the U.S., Bloomberg's Henry Wren is joining us as well as Sarah Jacob. It is brilliant to have you both with us. And I mean, first and foremost, Sarah, you cover the company from a real focal point over there in Amsterdam. What, what did you make of these numbers? Why was it such a shock, this sort of focus for growth instead of profitability at odds with everyone else? Yes, um, that's right. So Adyen reported earnings for the first half that missed estimates on both revenue and margins. Um, it posted um, its lowest net revenue growth since it was listed. Um, and the company attributed this to a weaker economic climate with high interest rates, infl inflation, and particularly increased price competition in North America. Uh, the other thing with Adyen is that they continue to hire and they hired about 550 employees uh, or so in the first half. And that too has on margins the first half. Uh, Henry, let's, let's bring the shares up and, and talk about this big drop. What's the street saying? Because 40% drop, essentially, biggest drop on record. Yeah, definitely. So 
When you think about a growth stock like Adyen, the scariest moment that you can have is when the street thinks that it's no longer a growth stock. So we saw these kind of things happening with Meta before the Facebook parent when its uh, flagship apps, apps hit the bump. And we see this kind of things happening with Adyen for sure as well, because we saw its North, Amer North American revenue, the growth actually uh, halved during the first half. Now, so the issue is, because um, we have seen several quarters, so Adyen missed earnings estimates, but it's the first time that we've seen since its IPO that it missed processing revenue estimates, processing volume estimate as well. And it's not just a miss, it's a miss of 8%. So the question is whether the company can revive its growth. We know the company has reiterated its medium term guidance, but there is now some concerns on whether the company can achieve its growth trajectory anymore, given the competition, especially in the US. And Sarah, dwell on that for a moment, because they have spoken out about this being this hiring, this focus on growth still, which is at odds with basically everyone else in the market, is for longer term potential here. But is this a cultural focus that they've got at the moment, the fact they want to be hiring in this market? How do you think they manage to convince investors? Well, uh, Adyen has been very vocal about the fact that they are in an investment mode. They're preparing the company for the next growth phase. I mean, they uh, they they listed only a few years back. So uh, they hired uh, about 1,200 employees last year, and they expect to hire a similar amount this year. So as I said, about 550, 51 employees in the first half itself. So uh, the company has, um, has said that this is their focus, uh, although they did mention that they will slow down hiring from next year. So yes, it is, it is in, in contrast with a lot of their peers who have announced job cuts in the past year. Uh, or so. All right, Bloomberg's Henry Wren and Sarah Jacob out in Amsterdam. Thank you so much. No, Caro, team coverage. But the reason I love this story is we, we're talking about a European tech name that's quite big. Mm. You read Henry's street rap. What they're worried about is that it's not competing against the big US names for merchants' attention. And whether or not they're just not willing to fight on a price perspective at the moment, whether or yeah. not it's their... Are they actually losing customers? Is it customers that just are using them a little bit less? They're not, of course, in this economic environment as willing to be paying up for their higher priced products. It's really interesting as to also how the competition coalesces. Of course, all eyes on what is the still private juggernaut that is Stripe and how much they manage to take in terms of market share. Yeah, but a commitment to hiring while the US peers are trimming jobs was quite interesting. All right, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Arthur is adding to its suite of large language model centered products. We're going to speak to the CEO, Adam Wenchel. That's coming up next from here in San Francisco, over in New York, four days into the week. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's dig into the markets halfway through this trading day. And actually, well, the Nasdaq 100, the bigger benchmark of the mighty powers of technology, actually sort of trading flat. We've seen the Nasdaq more broadly, the benchmark, under pressure today. Sentiment has been changing. We're worrying about, well, the backup in yields, the 10-year yield is up six, call it, five, six basis points at the moment on the 10-year. We really have seen this sudden shift higher in terms of longer-term rates, how far they're going much higher, and indeed what that signals about the Federal Reserve, because, well, this resilient U.S. economy means perhaps they have to keep those rates higher for longer. What does that mean for risk assets? Well, what it means for this risk asset, which is Bitcoin, is down for the day. In fact, we're breaking through that level that we've sustained for the last couple of weeks, the fact that we're now sub-28,000. We've really been in this trading range, and now we break to the lowest in two months for Bitcoin overall. Moving on to some individual names, because the reason the Nasdaq 100 is perhaps just managing to poke into the green is one individual mover that I'll finish on. But first, Apple, a tug lower in terms of points on some of the main benchmarks, off by a percentage point. OK, so we're all worrying about really how they can stimulate and drive forward growth, particularly of iPhone sales after their recent earnings. Disappointed. New Bank, I shine a light on well, this particular player, of course, over in Latin America, a key fintech focus on new banking, of course. We're off by 5%. 
why? Well, the founder, the co-founder and the CEO is actually selling out some of his stake, about 3%. So we dive lower on this particular company. Cisco up more than 4%, Ed. This we outlined already. The numbers looking good. AI already half a billion dollars worth of sales, Ed. Yeah, Cisco really a story about the corporate world down the chain investing in AI. But what about the labor market? Let me bring you this one. A new survey finds that many Americans say automation could easily replace their jobs. Younger workers, particularly black people and Hispanic Americans, feel most threatened by AI in the workplace compared to white counterparts. Some three quarters of those polled expect increased use of automation and AI to lead to more unemployment, with women more inclined to see that than men. That said, the poll also found that most Americans believe the increased use of the technology will generally be a good thing for workers. So some slight contradiction in that data set. Yeah, well, I mean, it just outlines, though, doesn't it, Ed, that there are anxieties deep. But there are also so many opportunities when it comes to artificial intelligence. And in fact, we've got the perfect guest to talk around that. Adam Wenschel's with us. He's the CEO of Arthur. It's a company that focuses on ensuring that these AI systems that many people are worried about are actually well managed, that they're deployed responsibly. And you've got this new tool, right, that's helping compare the plethora of large language models that are out there and see whether they fit your business case in particular. Adam, just talk us through, well, ultimately, this anxiety that lays deep that we're just talking about, whether you think it's well vindicated? Well, I think, you know, I, it's very understandable, the anxiety. I mean, when you interact with ChatGPT or some of these other systems, you, you really kind of, uh, it's breathtaking, right, how human-like the responses are. Um, but fortunately, look, AI has been being deployed in, in you know, just a, a lot in the last five years uh, and accelerating every year. And unemployment's still historically low. And there's like, there's very, very little evidence that AI is taking jobs. It is evolving jobs. It's evolving jobs quickly, but there's not mass uh, job loss coming from it, that, it that's been observed anywhere. So we, we go back to the Cisco story. What we know is that companies are investing either way. They're thinking about the use of large language models. The way that I see Arthur Bench, your product, is like when I'm buying a new laptop, right? I go into a grid side by side, I compare processing power, I compare the memory, I compare uh, operating system. You're basically offering the equivalent for companies to choose the best LLM for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think the important thing is that you're allowed, you can, you can test it on exactly what you want to do with it, right? And so the way you use your laptop is different from maybe the way, you know, the way my high schooler does or the way uh, my father does. And so you want to know how's this going to perform for me. And so I have like my own kind of proprietary data that I want to feed into the LLM and I want to ask it certain types of questions, put certain types of prompts in that. And there's a lot of really nuanced differences that can't be reduced down to just a single number on a leaderboard. And so that's where Arthur Bench comes in. It allows people to really test like the kinds of prompts that their users are providing with their data and see how it performs. You know, LLM, Caroline, large language model, it's, it's just become a blanket term. Yeah. But there's such variation between sort of the multiple billions of parameters, large language model, and something for everyone out there. Yeah. And I mean, I go back to when you and I first started doing the show together. It was November and what came out the gate, but ChatGPT that really seemed to set the world alight. And Adam, to that point, you know, when you're looking at the nuances within the large language models, how are we seeing them differentiate? And in particular, for example, it feels like Anthropic is on a bit of a roll recently with Claude 2. Yeah, Claude 2 has been, been great uh, in our testing. It's, it's doing a good job of... Uh, not you know not answering questions when it should be answering questions and not answering them when it doesn't know the answer, um, uh, and so there's you know that can be very important. Um, yeah, Cloud Two definitely performs impressively. You know, there's also we see big differences in terms of the way they they hedge, for instance, and so some of the models are much more likely to to not want to answer a question and to um, to say, hey, I'm an LLM, I shouldn't be answering this or or it's not my place. And so depending on the application, that may be appropriate or it may be a big drawback. And so that's that's why those are some of the differences that that we that our testing and our tool can tease out for people. Adam, how do we democratize? AI technology access to it so that we lo like lower the threshold right where you don't need to have control of all the NVIDIA H100s or billions yeah. of dollars for the training. How does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. It's a big concern right now, access to, to that hardware, both the expense and just the availability of it. 
I think fortunately these these systems will become more efficient over time. And you know there are other uh, vendors who are starting to make hardware more capacity coming online. It's going to take a little while um, until until that happens. Um, but the nice thing with open source models is you can get a pre-trained model that you can either just use or modify. And so you know what, what Facebook's done with Llama V2 and a number of other people have done with um, the, the open release of these models, that's really put them in the hands of a lot of people who might not have had access to them before. Can, uh, can Arthur make money with this business model, particularly <laughs> if we move towards an increasingly open sourced world? Yeah, absolutely. There, look, we, there are things that we do that are proprietary, like our ability to detect and block hallucinations. Um, and so not everything we do is open source, but in this case, we just felt it was really important because um, this is the sort of uh, feeling confident that you're making the right choice about your system and that you, that, you're, that you can put it out in production and trust that it goes well is, is a major impediment for a lot of people. And we really saw it slowing down people in the process of deploying. And ultimately, what's good for us is for uh, as many people as possible to put these systems into production so that we can protect and, and monitor them. And so uh, the reason we open source this is just to sort of uh, accelerate people's ability to deploy these these tools in a, in a responsible way in, in an enterprise. Ultimately, though, your own business of Arthur is about making money and you're backed by what Index Ventures, Accrued Capital, Graycroft and the like. I'm interested as to the groundswell of hype and reality. How much are you seeing companies coming to you wanting to get your services, wanting to understand where they put their money to work in AI LLMs? Yeah, it's been it's been unlike anything I've ever seen in my career. And I think it's because, you know, ChatGPT is just so accessible. Anyone can go in and play around with it and see the the um, uh, just the power of it. And so it's become a board level issue at, at everything from Fortune 100s down to every single startup where boards are asking the CEO and the CIO, what is our generative AI strategy and how is it going to transform our business? And so that that um, that sense of urgency has cascaded through the organization. And so we're seeing all sorts of project teams uh, mobilizing and and working on um, you know ways to transform some of the key leverage points in their business using LLMs. And it's been it's just been breathtaking to see. And so that's what we, you know, we, we come in, uh, a lot of times they call us to help them because it's, you know, there, there's a lot of little details that are, that collectively are a little bit daunting when you're trying to stand up one of these systems, even though ultimately it's pretty uh, accessible technology. Uh, there's certainly a learning curve and, and we help a lot of our customers with that as well as solving some of the common deployment uh, challenges around, um, you know, hallucinations and prompt injection and leaking sensitive data, things like that. Adam Wenchel, Arthur CEO, thank you very much for joining us here on Bloomberg Technology. Now, after his world tour to discuss the latest developments in artificial intelligence, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman reflected on the emotional powers of the technology and the need for global regulation. Bloomberg Originals host and executive producer Emily Chang spoke to him for the latest episode of The Circuit. Was the goal more listening or explaining? The goal was more listening. It ended up with more explaining than we expected. We ended up meeting like many, many world leaders and talked about the sort of the need for global regulation. And that was like more explaining. The listening was super valuable. I came back with like 100 handwritten pages of notes. I, I heard that you do handwritten, notes. handwritten what, notes. What happens to the handwritten notes? But in this case, like I distilled it into like, here are the top 50 pieces of like feedback from our users. And, mm -hmm. What we need to go off and do but there's like a lot of things when you like get people in person like face to face or over a drink or whatever where people really will just like say you know here is like my very harsh feedback on what you're doing wrong and what i want to be different you didn't go to china or russia i spoke remotely in china but not russia should we be worried about them um and where they are on ai or what yeah, they i do would with love it? to know more precisely where they are that would be helpful we have, I think, very imperfect information there. So how has ChatGPT changed your own behavior? There's like a lot of like little ways and then kind of like one big thought. The, the little ways are, you know, like on this trip, for example, the translation was like a lifesaver. Um, I also use it uh, if I'm trying to like write something, which I write a lot to never publish, just like for my own thinking. And I find that I like write faster and can think more somehow. So it's mm -hmm. like a great unsticking tool but then the big way is i am i am I, I see the path towards like this just being like my super assistant for all of mm. my cognitive work super assistant yeah you know we've talked about relationships with chatbots did you see this as something that people could get emotionally attached to and how do you feel about that 
I think language models in general are something that people are getting emotionally attached to. Um, and, you know, I have like a complex set of thoughts about that. I personally find it strange. I don't want it for myself. I have a lot of concerns. I don't want to be like the kind of like people telling other people what they can do with tech. But it seems to me like something we need to be careful with. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman with our own Emily Chang. You can watch the rest of the interview on the circuit with Emily Chang. She also sat down with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. Is it tonight? 10 p.m. in New York, Bloomberg Television are available to stream 8 p.m. if you want a little bit of an earlier bedtime on Bloomberg Originals. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to be breaking down Synopsis's third quarter earnings with the CEO, Arthur Goose, from New York, from San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's get to Synopsys. This is the chip design software maker reporting third quarter results that topped estimates, raised guidance, AI a big part of performance, but also announcing that Sazin Ghazi will assume the role of president and CEO effective January 1st, 2024. For more, let's bring in Art Degeus, Synopsys' current but outgoing CEO. Art, welcome to Bloomberg Technology. It was interesting, real growth in China. That's where I want to start. And I want to start there because no one asked you about it on the earnings call. Why and how are you growing in China? Well, you know, the, the growth was strong this quarter, partially also because it was the post-COVID uh, uh, quarter. And in general, China has remained strong for us for, for the, the last 10 years, uh, while simultaneously, of course, having certain restrictions on uh, what we can do there. But, uh, you know, design of chips continues everywhere in the world at a very high speed, and that's not any different uh, in China. You booked so far in the year, I think I'm right in saying about uh, $500 million of AI sales as well. What is the main driver of that? Uh, because you, you essentially create software that is used in the chip design process. So what is it that's driving the AI-specific growth? Well, you know, already for the last few years, if you look at the most advanced, most hard driving chips, AI is in the middle of that, right? And actually in your own uh, uh, reporting, you have so much on AI, which is all uh, driving the need for much faster, lower power, much higher capacity uh, chips. And so the competitiveness of those is absolutely essential. That's another way of saying is they are the ones that use the most advanced silicon technologies and also the most complex architectures. And this is where Synopsys uh, is uh, the leader. We do the most advanced chips, or we, I should say we support our customers in doing the most advanced chips in the world for our entire existence. And here is a wave yes. that is just continuing to grow. Caroline, I express surprise that no one asked about China because Art is talking about the cutting edge of chip technology mm. in that context, which is a, a very hard environment right now. Yeah, that feels politically charged as well, Art. Can you just talk us through sort of the restrictions, the, the concerns about allowing your very specific software to be used by China when we're worried about the, the tensions and the AI races it seems to be deemed? Yeah, I didn't say that the most advanced AI chips come from China, right? There, there are many uh, companies that are investing in that. Some of the very large semiconductor companies are absolutely driving the state of the art. And some of the most advanced startups in the world are driving the state uh, of the art. And those are the, the, the customers that first come to us because they very much rely on the ability to differentiate. And, you know, if, if there's one word I would put on that, the speed of the chip determines everything. And if you look at, at the wave of opportunity that's now coming in via uh, Gen AI, all of these algorithms initially take a lot of computation. And uh, the faster you can make those, the more opportunities there are there. And so it's one of those, those wonderful situations where the demand continually exceeds what our customers can deliver, i.e. the race is on. And in that race, we are a key ingredient to the success. But many of your... I'm sure peers over in Silicon Valley are really nervous about that race and 
boy, is the administration worried about that race. What sort of contracts do you have with China and are you getting any pushback in terms of your ability to sell there? Uh, well, you know, it's actually fairly straightforward. The, the rules of engagement are very clear. We follow those uh, absolutely uh, to a T. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the issue is more for China itself than for us. It's a certain percentage of our business that is growing well over time. But notice also that, you know, we had a very strong quarter in Korea, for example. We, uh, over the year, have done well in all parts uh, of the world. And so, uh, yeah, if there were no restrictions, we could probably sell more to China. But uh, we live up to those restrictions. Uh, what I want to highlight, though, is you know, every nation today is investing in, in chip design. And I'm sure you're familiar with the U.S. Chips Act, mm -hmm. but really what's happening is all other nations have followed up with their own Chips Act. And while uh, we're not counting at all on these, what is clear is the whole world now understands chips are absolutely central to this whole new wave of what yes. we uh, call smart everything in the world. Uh, you've been at this company since the late 90s. I know that you're stepping down at the beginning of next year. I wanted to get your reaction to the Tower Semi and Intel news this week and how you think it will impact the M&A landscape in tech and in chips in particular. Well, actually, I've been there since the mid-80s because I started the Apologies, company. Apologies, mid-80s. Uh, no, no problem. But, but it gives a very interesting perspective, right, because uh, many of these companies that you're reporting on, some of them existing, uh, existed already at that time, and they all have had the same uh, pathway, which is how to stay close to the leading edge. And Intel is a great example of that. And right now, they are substantially investing in, in their next uh, edge. And you may have seen the, the agreement that we did earlier this week, which is very important, where we provide many of the building blocks that are necessary for them to be successful in the foundry world. And these building blocks get specifically designed for their most advanced technology. Yeah. And in general, part of our role is to support uh, all the foundries to go to market. And what they need is they need uh, the, the design tools to be ready for them, and they need the IP blocks to be ready for, uh, from them. And we provide both of those. And yeah. we provide those for a broad set of foundries. And that race is on too. And so th this notion of, of the race forward is actually a big positive. You're certainly familiar with you know, 50 years of Moore's Law that was an exponential of, uh, of unseen magnitude. We've entered a new one of these. Yeah. And the new one is that multiple chips are going to get together in very high proximity, including you know, stacking them. It's almost like moving from building houses to, moving hotel, to building hotels now. And this uh, is all driven by smart everything. The focus. Focus for you, the focus for the person who picks up from you in January 2024. You founded the business, co-founded it back in 1986. And an amazing time to be handing over to Sassine. We thank you so much, Art Dugius. He's Synopsis CEO from New York, San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. So let's add New York City to the list of places TikTok access will be banned on government-owned phones. This comes while in California moves ahead with stronger language in its own TikTok ban bill. Bloomberg's technology, Alex Barinka, is ever a busy woman. So talk us through it. Yeah, in New York City, um, that security threat that a lot of legislators have talked about has come to the forefront. The New York City Cyber Command called it a, quote, threat to the city's technical networks and made the decision this week to give uh, the city 30 days to get it off uh, of government phones. The state of California, though, is taking a little bit of a longer approach. There's a bill that was pr um, authored by Senator Bill Dodd. That's California SB 74. That bill has been approved by the Assembly Committee to basically uh, ban it on on all government phones as well. That bill still has to go to the Appropriations Committee and then to Governor Gavin Newsom's desk. But there was one point in, in our reporting from that uh, passage in Assembly Committee today that I thought was interesting. Dodd said that TikTok has been running interference. So while this app is getting banned on government devices in states and municipalities, more than 35 states in the US, it's still running quote unquote interference and trying to convince lawmakers to not just ban TikTok, but to widen up the ban to all entertainment devices. It hasn't quite worked, that argument, in TikTok's defense. We're still seeing these bans roll on, uh, but California yeah. is probably the next one that we'll be watching closely. All the inside track, Alex Barinka, we thank you. Meanwhile, Ed, that does it from this edition of Bloomberg Technology.
Yeah, just the earnings season relentless continues. Recap everything from the show in our podcast, Apple, Spotify, and the Bloomberg platforms. From here in SF and out in New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology.